Well, first of all, I want to welcome everyone uh, for joining this in what we hope will be the first of many fruitful, uh, productive industry networking sessions. Um, I think, as you know, from some of the emails that um, you've received, that this is something that, um, and Stephanie is going to talk about this, this is a model that has worked exceptionally well in the commercial real estate industry. Um, real professionals network uh, is something that I've uh, been aware of for since its inception. I happen to have been on the ground floor. Uh, the founder of it is a close friend of mine. Uh, and we brainstormed ideas and, uh, and over the past decade, is it Stephanie? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, over the past decade, it really uh, has become a, a significantly valuable way for people to uh, come together. Now, the difference with the commercial real estate model, which is based on locations, markets that are cities, the concept is bringing together people who are um, able to help each other. So they're not necessarily competitors. Uh, and in the commercial real estate world, it's a, a tenant broker, it's a, 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 a landlord broker, it might be a developer, a construction company, a lawyer, an accountant, whatever. Uh, and, we, and this model really excels um, when uh, the groups are curated and assemble on a regular basis as mastermind groups where you can have some real candid sharing uh, in somewhat of a, uh, a safe environment. Uh, and, and I think there's a number of people here who have been part of some of those commercials. So I don't wanna go on because we're gonna talk about that. But I wanna speak to um, why I think this is really important um, for those of us who are participating. Some of you I know, some of you I don't know, I, I don't know, uh, and that's the point. Uh, we're here to expand our networks and in a world of, of Zoom meetings and COVID shutdowns and lack of trade shows and lack of sales calls <laughs> or reduced uh, uh, person, there, there really is an opportunity to develop that, that kind of relationship that you all know is vital in terms of who can you, who can you reach out to with a question, who can, uh, who can help you solve a problem, uh, or, or who can you help uh, solve a problem? So, you know, we have really this represents uh, an excellent uh, illustration of we've got um, we've got salespeople, we've got accounting people, we've got uh, brand developers, we've got um, strategists, we've got investors. Um, all coming together uh, for these roundtables. So the roundtable is really the model that I want to share a little bit uh, 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 to, to kind of explain uh, this here. Um, is that the video or is that the thing? Hold on one moment. Let me share the correct screen. So this is a little um, overview not what I wanted to share. That's the promo video that was rolling. So I'm trying to get rid of that. But I will go, I'll go, go through a couple of quick um, elements here. Doesn't want to lose my screen. Here we go. Now we're back. So the, the first aspect of this is the, uh, the monthly roundtables, which we have uh, designated as first Friday. It's a memorable way. It's a good way to kick off a Friday. It's early happy hour. If you want to bring a drink, you can. Uh, and these are going to be open to everyone. We're hoping that there will be a, a continual flow and that all of you will refer others to join and share. Uh, it really is a, a chance to just come together and meet and greet. It's not the in-depth marketing, but it's the launch pad for that. Out of this, we hope that many of you will choose to um, participate, uh, will hopefully invite others. Uh, and it's an inviter, invited member program. Um, there is a, a membership fee uh, available uh, uh, related to that, uh, a minimal membership fee. And that's based on the concept that if you don't invest anything, you don't care about it and you don't make it a priority. Um, but that allows us to uh, curate groups uh, of people that, that can balance each other out and can help really develop richer and lasting business relationships. 
We are also um, um, developing uh, relationships with member companies and a member company um, has advantages of uh, not just being visible, but also to be able to invite their team members and their prospects uh, and customers um, um, for to be part of mastermind groups. Uh, and those founding member companies are also named and listed and featured in some of the um, on the online reference. And Stephanie could talk a little bit more about there's a there's a whole series of of supporting aspects of this that are that are intended to facilitate members to connect. Uh, and then a meeting, meeting champion. So mastermind groups where we're looking to curate one or two um, initial mastermind groups. I've spoken to a few of you about potentially being meeting champions. And I'm going to have Stephanie talk a little bit more about what that entails. Um, but I think it's really important that each group uh, have someone um, who uh, is motivated, uh, is experienced, uh, and can also serve uh, to, to influence uh, the direction of, of the conversations and the, and the groups. On that. And the last point that I'm going to make is that the elements from these monthly roundtables, not the mastermind groups, because that's really kind of in, internal, uh, but the conversations that are that are shared here, uh, we will be excerpting and highlighting as part of an ongoing series of, of video episodes and podcasts called Drinks Tank that we'll be releasing. And so in theory, by Monday, there will be an episode of Drinks Tank that releases and Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to describe a little bit more about what the what the aspects of that are before we um, then you can proceed with the roundtable. Before we come to the roundtable, so again, it's very nice to meet all of you, and I apologize that all of you were Stephanie Paters. Uh, we've had one gentleman join us. If you let us know who you are, we'll change your name from Stephanie Pater, and I apologize for that. I'd love to have those glitches on a Friday. So. Um, what we've found over the last decade with real professionals, as Michael told you, is this is really about being able to share what you're seeing in the marketplace, not an elevator pitch, but really what you're seeing that's unique and different. Um, and what we have found through the course of all of our mastermind groups and then connecting people across our network is it's you always need a someone, a resource someone that you end up doing a deal with, someone that you can bounce an idea off of. As, as Rick Lackey, founded a uh, role professional says, I got a guy, right? So everybody always says that, but I always think about it from the standpoint of, I wanna have a trusted source of professionals that I can bounce my ideas off of. Um, so what we do to facilitate that is, as you saw coming through this morning, I gave you everybody's very basic information. Following this session, we'll send you everyone's V cards. Um, we will also send along the full summary of this with key takeaways and the recording. Um, as we go through our round table, we're going to have each of you share, tell us who you are, who you work with, where you're from, and then just tell us a little bit about your business, not so much elevator pitch, but kind of what you're seeing, and especially during this time when it's been so hard to connect at trade shows, et cetera, like Michael said. And we're going to try, we've got a good group here. We want to make sure we get to everyone. So we'll try to hold everyone to three to four minutes if we can. Um, Michael referenced our champions. What they do, as, as much as it is drive the conversation, um, but really make sure everybody's engaging. And so after each of you speak, I will ask if anyone has any questions feel free to unmute yourself because we do wanna make this interactive. You will, like I said, get everyone's contact information, but if somebody says something that piques your curiosity, ask, I'll be asking for connections and I'll make sure that both of you are connected. We used to take everyone's business cards and put them in the stack of big business cards and you always forget to follow up. We will send you a specific email that says Jordan and Michael you wanted to connect on X. So it'll be sitting in your inbox and haunt you, right? So but getting that inbox cleaned out is always everybody's important topic. So uh, we're looking forward to an interactive conversation. My background is real estate. Um, I enjoy a cocktail as much as the next person. So I'm actually also here to learn. Um, I won't be asking questions today, but I will be taking notes. So if I'm looking down and not at you, that's what I'm doing. So Michael, should we get started? Absolutely. Okay, great. As I put together, um, we've been doing this on Zoom for a year, obviously with a pandemic. And so I'm gonna just go down the list. If I skip over anyone, it's because they're not here. We're gonna have a couple people join late. So I'll join, you know, come back to them. But Sherman, I'm gonna start it with you if that's all right. And I, again, everybody feel free to unmute yourself. All right. 
Thank you very much. I'm impressed with the significant amount of organization here. Thank you very much. And Michael, thank you for the, uh, the invitation uh, to you're be you're here. Always, you're always first on my guest list. <laughs> uh, and when I get to about 30 seconds left, don't be afraid to say, hey, bring it home. So uh, <laughs> Absolutely. We'll do. my company uh, is Shared Spirits Marketing. We're, uh, I'm Sherman Moore, M-O-H-R, obviously, a little left-handed spelling. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm the CEO of a company called Shared Spirits Marketing, and we're a tech-forward, tech-enabled spirits and wine marketing firm. And what that really means is we started with a technology innovation that, oddly enough, have you guys ever went to solve for a problem that you realized after some time the market wasn't asking for a fix? Uh, that's kind of what we started with. We we built some technology, uh, customize it. It works very well. It allows people to buy, share, and redeem individual cocktails, wine, and beer drinks from restaurants in our platform, and then share those drinks with individuals after they do an in-app purchase. And then the individual receives a, a ping on their phone. They download the app. They take the phone back into the restaurant or bar, show it to the bar staff who's been trained to know what to do, receive their drink, and then Shared Spirits pays the venue. And our original model was to go to spirits and wine brands and say, hey, we've got this great tool. We can feature your brand and your key accounts menu. You can pay us money. We convert that money compliantly into drink credits that can be dispersed through influencers and ambassadors shared through that network and then properly redeemed and, and tracked. Pretty cool stuff. Well, the reality was the spirits and wine industry at the time we launched told us, hey, our marketing people don't know how to consider that and our legal people don't know how to classify. So we started doing what they wanted us to do, which is events and in-store tasting. What I've seen in the marketplace over the last year, of course, is massive this. All the, the on-premise spending went away for us. There was none there. And they said, hey, we'll still do in-store tastings. This started again in July here in Nashville. And now we're doing significant in-store tasting work uh, for numerous brands, primarily Empire uh, as a distributor here in Middle Tennessee, Knoxville and Chattanooga starting uh, this month. So our real pivot as we've seen the marketplace respond is to go directly to restaurants. So our model going forward will be to allow restaurants to leverage our technology, feature cocktails or wine by the glass in our app. They'll pay us marketing dollars. We convert that into drink credits. Those are deployed out through their audience. They're chosen big spenders. They're chosen bartenders. They're chosen GM staff. And those people share those, uh, those cocktails and those folks come back into the restaurant to build foot traffic. We find right now in our research and our discussions that it's the restaurant and bars that need help. Um, some of the craft spirits people may vastly disagree with that, but we know our connections are telling us that uh, the restaurants and bars need help getting that traffic back in again. And that's what we're seeing 2021. Sir, can I ask a question? Uh, Absolutely. Are you uh, are you seeing any uh, movement on the uh, cocktails to go with the uh, with this model? We will we will be featuring that front and center. So we're we're hearing from our restaurant partners that they want to feature uh, in the areas where they have to uh, to go meals married with uh, the carafe or the to go wine or the to-go cocktail or the to-go beer, whatever's allowed in there. And we're all, I think we're all who have Google Alerts set, we're seeing to-go become semi-permanent in many states now. It's not quite that, that way in Tennessee. I'm not hearing that as pressure in, in the Dallas market, for instance, Michael, because things are open up there and you know they're experiencing pretty good crowds in the markets that we're working down oh, there. Not, not, not to, I need to move on to the next person, but I do want to make a point, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of you, Chris uh, Green, since uh, of, of uh, Spirit Legend Spirits USA. I was visiting with Chris yesterday at their uh, distillery up in um, uh, in Cumming, Georgia, and they're 
you know, opening a tasting room. And that's obviously a big uh, piece of the action for a lot of the smaller producers is driving that retail direct to this model could work really effectively, yeah. you know, especially someone, I mean, not to steal your thunder, Chris, you'll tell your story, but you know, their, their distillery is in an industrial park. So it has to, you know, you gotta, you gotta create that destination on that. But anyway, uh, yeah. not, not to take, sorry, uh, so, but. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sherman. Any questions for Sherman? I'm eager to get on and find where in Atlanta I can try this for the first time. So, so I'm I, have a I have a, yeah, ahead, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, hi, hi Sherman, it's nice to meet you. That's an nice incredible setup that you've, that you've done for your, for your company. And you're so right with respect to what's going on with the on-premise, given what's going on with COVID, because everything is kind of shifted to the off-premise. How do you, how did you organize the restaurants um, in Nashville and, and link up, you know, the, the customers so that they knew where to go um, to get these, these drinks? How did that, how did that, how'd you get that set up? That's pretty cool what you've done. Well, let me tell you, it's a heavy lift because, you know, working with restaurants is a, is a street battle. And right. um, we don't integrate with POS systems. So what we've had to do is leverage the connections of uh, a collaborator in our company who actually runs an on-premise team for mm. a distributor. So okay. he was kind enough to tee up introductions for us as a believer in what we do. And then we subsequently baited here in Nashville and we'll beta in Dallas and we'll kind of beta in Atlanta but everything we've done so far has been all beta work here in Nashville and it's worked fairly well, but we've had to go in literally explain, teach, train and integrate. And it's just like when you're launching a new brand to the, to the, to the on-premise market, it is one establishment at a time. It's right. Right. <laughs> and especially with a new service that's driven by technology, you know, Sherman, it hasn't been done before, you know? So I, yeah. I take my hand off to you. It's, it's when you're, when you're, coming out of left field in an environment like this and trying to show value to a channel that really got hurt hard, you know, yeah. um, that took a lot, it takes a lot of faith and, and, and courage, you know? Well, and, and maybe not knowing what the hell I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's total transparency. That's great. Yeah, that's what this is all about, right? It is, it is. Yeah. Uh, Very any cool. other any other questions for Sherman or any connections? Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Sherman. Pleasure uh, to meet you. You mentioned about doing the Atlanta market. Are you going to be trying to work through with uh, Empire on that one in, in the Atlanta market? I believe we'll have some success there. I don't know those people personally yet, but we've got a very good relationship with Empire here in Nashville. And uh, so we know we're already working with brands that distribute through Empire in Atlanta and Colorado and yeah. In East Tennessee, so it'll be natural for us to be working. Well, Empire Empire distributes your products, Chris. Correct. Yep. I was going to so, say something. So that I, may be uh, Sherman, That may be a way in if you've got a brand. Yeah. That's, hey, I want you to look at this. So you guys should exactly. actually be a connection. I, I'm going to make that connection actually, if that's all right. Thank you. Please, yeah, because yeah, I can definitely get you in with uh, the people you need to speak with at Empire yeah. here in Atlanta. We have a very good relationship with them, and we can make something happen. Well, right. they listen to you guys. They don't listen to us. They listen to you guys. They do. You <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Any others? All right, Mark. And again, I apologize for calling you Chuck. It's been a whole name game today. So I apologize. No worries. Go ahead, no worries. No worries. Well, it's, it's nice to meet everybody um, on this on this Zoom call. I apologize for not being able to use my laptop. Uh, Michael knows the story. I've been uh, battling back and forth for the last month or so with Kaspersky, my the antivirus software I have on my laptop. And long story short, they I uh, uploaded an automatic uh, upload uh, upgrade to my Kaspersky back in January. And it's kind of locked me out of my uh, the use of my webcam. So- um, You're here, it's a workaround. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyways, um, my, my background is consumer marketing. Uh, 35 years plus in basically two different industries, food and beverage, and then adult uh, alcoholic beverage spirits. The first 16 years was international marketing and new business development for companies like Durkee Foods, Borden, Pepsi, Wrigley and Snapple, traveling to Europe, the Middle East and Central and South America, helping to build their businesses. And then I did a big pivot in the late 90s where I wanted to work in the US market. And that's where I 
left Snapple uh, to join uh, Diageo. And that was my first foray into the uh, U.S. spirits market. So I spent two and a half years with Diageo, working on brands like uh, Bailey's Irish Cream, Malibu Rum, uh, uh, Mal yeah, Malibu Coconut Rum, Appleton Rum, and then was uh, recruited in 2001 to join Bacardi in a more national marketing role, uh, helping to lead a, a group of people in brand management, working on brands like Sapphire Gin, Martini and Rossi, Di Sorono. And then I spent uh, the last four years at Bacardi uh, working exclusively in, in innovation, uh, uh, new, you know, creating new concepts. And that's kind of like where I found my, my, uh, my passion. Um, in 2009, the innovations group at Bacardi was rolled back to London um, due to the global recession. And I left the company to start my own consultancy. And since then, I've been working exclusively with startups in the spirits industry. And so, so through some networking efforts the last uh, few years, Michael and I hooked up and we've been working together on different projects um, under Victory Spirits. I still have my own you know, consultancy, but I really work exclusively with helping startups in the spirits industry. Um, and I would say in terms of trends that are going on right now in the industry, um, a few key things that have happened, uh, I think one pre-COVID, uh, there was a, a, an emerging trend within startups within the industry to say, you know what, can we get a level playing field with respect to our, the FET taxes that we have to pay? And in December of this year, um, Congress and the president signed a new bill into law that now allows uh, startups to have a bit of an equal playing field with their businesses and their P&Ls, the FET taxes was reduced from $13.50 a proof gallon to $2.70 per proof gallon. That's been a huge, made a huge impact in a positive way to startup companies in the industry. I think another thing that's happened, um, certainly because of uh, COVID, it started before, but it's really accelerated since then is the direct-to-consumer channel. We still have a three-tier system in this country that's been led, obviously, and, and, and managed and, and uh, under law by prohibition laws. Each state has their own set of prohibition laws. And we still have the three-tier system, right? So supplier, distributor, uh, retailer. But you've got now a direct-to-consumer. Uh, you've got an active, you know, a captive consumer in the home that's now looking for ways to, to buy uh, spirits and cocktails um, and have them delivered to their home. So you've got you know, software companies like Drizzly was recently bought by Uber for over a billion dollars. That's going to help to accelerate the direct to consumer uh, channel. And I think the other thing that's happened too was the ongoing consolidation within the industry at the, at, at, within all three tiers. So recently, Constellation Brands sold a chunk of their lower priced wine brands um, to Gallo. And Constellation then pivoted the rest of their portfolio to uh, align with Southern Glacier. So the distributors have really gotten a lot bigger now in this country. Uh, I've worked in, like I said, different industries, but I've never seen a distributor uh, at some point become larger than some of the suppliers. So you've got Southern Glacier now at around 15 to $17 billion in size with a large portfolio. And the implication on that for startups is they've got to find other distributor partners to help them with their, with their businesses. And there's been a, a, an ongoing effort to, with some of these smaller distributors to, to build, their, build their brands. And then the other thing that's happened too is ready to drink category. It's grown by leaps and bounds. Hard seltzers has become a big player and the in the uh, spirits the industry. Cocktail uh, you know, is, is huge. Yeah. Um, you know, Mark, uh, uh, the, uh, the piece of this that's also uh, significant is the laws that have been um, changed in many st in states to allow direct to consumer delivery from the producers, um, uh, direct to consumer is, is huge. And many of those will be permanent, you know, like Kentucky and, and, and Virginia and all that. So I don't know, you know, some of you guys are probably experiencing that as well. Love it. Mark, thank you so much. Questions for Mark or any connections? All right, Robbie, you're welcome. I, I know. Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, I'm already connected to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just push you two together. It's all good. Robbie, go ahead. Good to have you here. Hi, guys. I am a, a wine and spirits broker in the Dallas area. Uh, I have about 40 wineries I represent in about 15 to 18 distilleries uh, all over the world. 
uh, I have several brands I do nationally, but primarily I'm Texas and adjoining states. Uh, 40 years in the industry, uh, 30 of that with RNDC and its predecessors. That's pretty much it. So what, what are you seeing in terms of the pull? I know there's a, there's a lot of discussion in terms of, you know, the, 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 obviously the growth, the explosive growth in the retail categories. Um, but I'm hearing a lot of conflicting information in terms of what's selling. And there's a lot of pressure from the distributors to force price points lower um, to, from smaller producers to meet the bigger producers. You know, I, I've had three conversations this week, unrelated, uh, that all are saying, we got to get the price below $29 because that's what's selling. Uh, are you seeing shifts in, in that, in the, in the products that you're repping? Uh, both directions, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Super premium. I've got a lot of super premium items I'm representing as well. I've got tequilas that are going for as much as $350. Uh, a unit, and then I also have uh, mass uh, production of uh, Russian vodka that is getting down to Smirnoff pricing. Mm -hmm. so, uh, a little bit of both, but during the pandemic, what I've seen the most of is popular price goods have really um, uh, been the mainstay, and of course, nationally advertised brands as well. Mm -hmm. From from a category standpoint. Um, I know that um, research that I saw earlier in 2020 was, you know, significant growth in tequila as everybody was doing pre-mixed uh, margaritas to go as the first thing. Uh, American whiskey bourbons continue to grow, but as Mark alluded to, this absolute explosive growth in pre-mixed cocktails and, and ready to go. And now we've seen a lot of a, of a you know, a movement in the market of, of of everybody trying to come up with their bottled Manhattan, bottled old fashioned, um, you know, as a way to capture that. Um, your your view on that? What have you seen? Well, the the biggest explosion here has been for the uh, the cider drinks and also the seltzers have just gone crazy uh, in the last year or two. And it's really confusing to the consumer in that. I was in a, several uh, total lines yesterday and. Uh, they're all over the place on the shelf. There's certain products that are in the wine section. There's stuff in the RTD section. There's stuff in the beer section. It's a, it's a, kind of a confusing category. So I think uh, those need to be worked together as some kind of single unit. Uh, yeah, I can kind of build on that for a second. Uh, if I could, guys, you, when you look at the ready-to-drink category, there's three different sub-segments uh, based on what the, what the primary source of alcohol is. The largest segment is the uh, malt beverage segment, you know, uh, and the beer companies have gotten into that in a big way because they've lost some of their business to millennial consumers that are looking for lower proof, uh, to your point, guys, ready to drink cocktails. So they're using the malt base to help to stabilize their, their losses and also recruit new consumers. You know, the second segment that's very small is the wine. So Joya is, a, is an example of a brand that's got a wine base as it's as a uh, alcohol. And then the third one, which is really growing significantly is spirit based, ready to drink seltzers. One, one would be like Cutwater is a brand with uh, spirit base. But you know, to your point, you make a good point. It's a little bit uh, confusing to consumers. Uh, there's probably gonna be some consolidation within the, uh, within the category, but everybody's really bullish on it because uh, it's still growing at uh, significantly high double digit rates year over year. And they're expecting it to continue that way to the mid, you know, you know mid 2020s, let's say. Um, and I think the other part that's gonna happen, you're gonna see more functionality coming into that category now. And because there's a consumer base out there that's uh, um, a bit marginalized, they can't metabolize alcohol for whatever reason. And they're looking at the lower proof type products to enjoy the same kind of cocktail experiences that friends have with the higher proof drinks. Hey, hey, Robert. Anna, go ahead, Well, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, um, I don't know how many uh, smaller craft brands you represent, but you know, during the most of last year, the big brands did extremely well off premise relative to the craft. 
was just wondering if you're seeing any of the smaller craft brands see a bit of a growth and resurgence uh, of demand. And are stores adding more of those? Right? Is that for, was that for Rob? And Robbie, don't forget yeah. to unmute. There you go. Yeah. It was. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm seeing, uh, uh, a lot of growth in the in the craft business. Of course, here in Texas, with uh, Tito's coming on board twenty plus years ago, uh, the the craft spirits business here has has grown uh, a lot. Uh, just picked up this brand. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. It's made in my backyard in Grapevine, Texas, and it's a four grain bourbon. Uh, I've got it in about a dozen states this year. So there is still a lot of room in the craft category, for sure. Uh, a lot of the brands I represent are startups from really all over. I'm uh, kicking off a Brazilian sparkler uh, next month uh, that's, that has a private label in Total Wine that they did roughly 600,000 cases just in total last year. So uh, that could be a, um, a big number. Any other questions for Robbie or any connections? Fascinating. As an aside, all the keto, all the keto folks, <laughs> all the keto folks that are doing the keto diet are loving the seltzers too. So I would no like wonder it's all booming. I have a connection for me with Robbie because I want to discuss uh, a bourbon um, brand uh, with him. Uh, that Got it. In some of those states. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Bobby, I just I just have a question there. Um, what are you seeing happening in terms of uh, Irish whiskey and also in terms of gin in the, the, the stores that you're 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 dealing with? Is that for Robbie? <laughs> That's for Robbie. Sorry, Robbie. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Irish whiskeys are uh, have grown tremendously. Uh, over the last 10 year period. But of course, uh, the, the mainstay, Jameson, still controls that market. But uh, uh, most of the big companies, as I'm sure uh, Mark can attest to as well, uh, have branched out to try to acquire or start up Irish whiskey brands. Mm -hmm. uh, gins are a growing market. I think there's some staleness in vodkas that I think vodka drinkers are looking for bigger, bolder flavor. So I think your uh, vodka drinkers are starting to experiment again in gin, but gin is still a very small category. And something you see in the gin category is uh, consumers are very loyal to their labels. Uh, mm -hmm. Once they find a gin that they like, they tend to stick with it. Okay. Um, I, know, I know that Mark and I have had over the past uh, year or two, a number of conversations with uh, uh, related to Irish gins that were interested in coming into the market in the U.S. Although, um, I you know I, I that kind of got uh, shut down a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. With export issues and COVID issues, but uh, I, I have I would I would say that I, I have a sense that um, to follow up on what uh, Ravi was saying that. Um, the vodka market is going to is going to continue to lose share to the gin, the gin category. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing that. Interesting. All right. Well, Michael, we're coming to you next. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I I'm I'm not exactly sure how I ended up on this. Uh, as you can tell, I'm I'm uh, not from the USA. I'm uh, coming to you from Dublin, where it is uh, just gone five o'clock on Friday evening. So. Um, it's, it's it's uh, gin o'clock time here nearly um, so uh, yeah I mean we're a small Irish uh, family owned business Lockery Distillery right in the very centre of Ireland if any of you have ever been we're literally bang in the very centre yep. um, and um, we are building a whiskey distillery uh, we're currently operating a gin distillery or a micro distillery where we make gin uh, we actually make two gins, one called Slingshot, which is the only distilled spirit in the world that actually contains peat as a botanical. The reason mm -hmm. we do that is because we're the whole area where we come from, it's we're 
right in the heart of peat bogs. Um, and it's something that, you know, we felt was a kind of a very unique botanical to, to, to use in our product. But it actually, um, it add, we don't, not just using it as a gimmick, we, we do it because it actually adds real kind of depth and complexity to the product. Uh, we also make the only 100% Irish gin, uh, which is made with Irish juniper, which is particularly rare, but we make the only, so it's, it's just made with Irish juniper and Irish whey spirit. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's very unusual. And that's just one uh, best signature, or country winner of best signature botanical bin, gin at the World Gin Awards. And it's won a gold medal at the World Gin Awards as well. And our slingshot has won 11 medals um, to date in international competitions. We also bottle Irish whiskey. Um, so while we wait for our own distillery to be up and running and while we wait for our spirits to mature, we have a range of kind of exclusive single cask uh, mature Irish whiskey releases. So we've brought out four to date uh, and we have a number of others in the pipeline. Um, and I suppose we're looking at another brand, which would be a, a blended Irish whiskey. Um, that we will be bringing out probably later, later this year. So that's our, um, we haven't been in the US market to date for various reasons. Um, one being, I suppose, the, the, the bottle size was a, was a challenge for us, just was uh, at, at our stage, um, the 750 mil bottle requirement was a challenge. Uh, that's obviously been, uh, been changed, but uh, not, not in every state as of yet, but it's something that, that will start to, to, to change and that opens up uh, possibilities for us to, to, to go into the US market. So we're currently speaking to importers um, and looking at a market entry to the US, but it, it, you know, it would be a, a limited market entry. Um, and obviously COVID has, has uh, challenges in that regard, but we're, we're, we're gonna do what we can. Um, so I, I suppose that's, that's where I was coming from with my questions, Robbie. <laughs> You, you can see the, the the background to them. I suppose I'm interested in knowing kind of the 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 levels where you see kind of growth in Irish whiskey, or for any of you on the call that have, have kind of a background in this, is it at the kind of premium level or is it at the kind of just above Jemison level? And um, you know where would you see the most potential for growth? Oh, good question. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, uh, a couple of things, Michael. It's it's great to talk to a fellow Irishman. Uh, I lived in uh, Ireland uh, when I worked at Pepsi. I lived in County Cork for three oh, years. Very good. very good. Yeah. Um, in terms of your question, you know, the good thing about about Irish whiskey is it's an aged product, right, Michael? And so the yep. American consumer has seen premiumization go across every category here in the United States for a number of years, starting with vodka back when Absolute kind of pushed the price point up on vodka back in the late '80s. And because vodka is a neutral grain spirit, after the global recession, they said, you know what, we don't need a premium, we don't want a premium brand. And I think that's why Tito's did, has done so well. But with aged products, Michael, aged products, including Irish whiskey, American consumers are saying, you know what, uh, we understand the aging process and we look for those brands uh, and are willing to accept and take a higher price point and, and buy at a higher price point. So whether it's American bourbons, American whiskeys, and certainly Irish whiskeys, and I think Robbie said it before, or somebody on the call said it before. Yeah, Jameson has been like the, has been the threshold, right? For a number of years, Americans know Jameson whiskey, but they're looking for other brands, especially ones that are unique. And I think the fact you have a peat, you know, you're using peat in some of your products, you know, could give you a point of differentiation that would be interesting to the younger, you know, millennial consumer in the U.S. So, um, you know. And as you think about market entry too, Michael, you're going to want to be really, you know, careful and maybe choose a, a couple of test markets first before you decide to go across the entire country because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a bit of expensive. So that's just a watch out. I'm wondering if Greg's ears are burning uh, because we're talking about international markets here. <laughs> So I, I think Stephanie, we may want to we want to tee up Greg. <laughs> Absolutely, I was going to say thanks we were for, going to Greg next. next. Yeah. yeah. No, we are going to him next. Um, uh, Greg, go ahead with any comments, but I do want to make sure if anybody has any questions for Michael. Um, great to have you here. I'm glad you could join us, and we're all jealous that you're already in uh, Gen 30. But yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> any well, other question? I don't know if it's for Michael. Go ahead, or, Michael. But just talking about general trends of uh, whiskeys and scotches, and you know, 
when I when I go to the liquor store, I typically the first thing I look at is the age of a bottle, right? And I look, I see it's 12, 15, 18, whatever it is. And I've been seeing over the past couple of years that that it, the, the trend has been moving away from aged bottles to sort of a blend. For example, you know, you have Lafroy that always had their, you know, their 18 year bottle. Now they have the Lafroy Lore bottle and it's a mix of different whiskey. I mean, what's the trend out there? What, where's the market going? Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. And um, I suppose what has happened is that the, the, the producers um, who, you know, the, the Lafroy's and the people like that who, who were dealing with, with, Kind of age statement product, um, they they don't have the stocks. Uh, there's been you know with with increased demand for spirits and and brown spirits, and um, there's been pressures on stocks and pressures on age stocks. And you know we've seen that in Ireland particularly uh, here. The the you know up until um, up until the early to up until kind of about two thousand and seven. There were yeah two thousand seven. There were only three distilleries operating on, on the island of Ireland. So there was only a certain amount of stock coming out of those. And if you want stock that's older than that, it, you know, it has to have come from Jemison, Bushmills or Cooley. And basically, uh, you know, that, that age stock is, is limited in terms of what's, what's there to go around. And likewise in Scotland, the same issues have, have arisen um, where basically, and if, again, if you look at it, you know, scroll back, you're back to recession times, 2008, 2009. So were companies investing in the stock at that point? Uh, and, and, you know, there was constraints on what was being actually put into barrel at that, at that stage. So that's what has led to, I suppose, a trend away from age statements. But it's also a qualitative, qualitative thing. So there's a consumer acceptedness that, and, and, and you know, a... a, a, a a drink specialist um, acceptance that something doesn't necessarily need to be 10 years or 12 years or 18 years old to be good. Um, now, you know, I've tasted some stuff that's been uh, from some US product actually that's that's been aged with uh, curly staves in a barrel uh, for six months. And, you know, while it was perfectly drinkable, I, I, I wouldn't call it whiskey. Um, but, um, you know, so there's somewhere in between. I mean, we brought out product in, we launched two products back in um, in December or late November just for the local market. And there were two peated Irish whiskies. Um, they were distilled in 2016 and we launched them in, in 2020. Um, so they were just over four years old, but they were very good. They were the, the, the spirit was good going into barrel uh, we put them in good barrels and they were they were actually peated whiskey so peated whiskey can can drink younger anyway but they were perfectly acceptable perfectly fine as, as whiskey but uh you know i've tasted whiskies that are five years old that are pot state with irish whiskies and i wouldn't i wouldn't say they're ready yet um you know so it depends on the product but you know age state and age on the bottle doesn't necessarily indicate um, that, that the product is good. And also you can have a case with barrels that stuff can be too long in a barrel or too long in a particular barrel and it just, it, it, it's gone, it's overcooked, so. I appreciate that, thanks for the explanation. That was uh, that's very insightful, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or connections for Michael? I just wanted to tag on what uh, Michael was just saying. Um, regarding the age statement and it's a very good you know question and to go on uh what was just said one of the big brands here in, in america is wella uh wella weeded is very popular it's sorted after a bourbon they always put the age statement on the bottles there's a trend now to where they've stopped doing that they actually are releasing bottles without that age statement um and so now it's a guessing game really what the actual age is I don't know if there was a financial reason they've done it or a marketing reason. I've never been able to actually, <clears throat> out. but uh, over here, the age statement, it's not as sought after as it used to be. <laughs> um, there is a huge market for it still where people want 15, 20, 27 year old, and they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. Um, but there's a lot of brands over here where they're 10 years younger 
six years younger and they're putting out world-class product and they're not putting the age statement on the bottle for that reason. So it's a different yeah. one now. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and, and you know, some of the stock that we have, uh, like we have stock that dates back to 2001 uh, and it's, it's actually late 2001. So, you know, we're probably going to sit on that stock until it's 2020, you know, to, in 2022, because then it's 21 year old, not 20 year old. And it's, you know, it, it, it gives you an extra, you know, allows you to charge a bit more for the bottle. And if they, if they, if it doesn't, if it's still in, in a good cask and it's still um, maturing okay, uh, it's worth, worth hanging on to it for the, for the extra, extra year. You know, I want to make a, a, an observation is that as we've, uh, Victory has recently started to build out uh, our wholesale um, bulk spirits marketplace, I've been amazed at how many um, inquiries we've gotten from people who are looking just for something that's five years. They don't even care what the mash bill is. <laughs> they want to know, what do you got? It's, it's five years and what's the cost? So there's definitely still some that are fully believing that just putting that number on there is going to, you know, give them the leverage to. to and and and, that, and that's that's that that's whiskey, obviously. And is that is that Irish whiskey or Scotch whiskey or? That's American. American whiskey. whiskey. Yeah, it's either what bourbons a... or rye. Yeah. Primarily, yeah. A, primarily a bourbon. Yeah. Okay. That they want, you know, I think part of that is that, uh, you know, bourbon go between two and four. Everybody has that. It's after four. There are uh, there there are fewer brands. So I think some of these um, these folks are looking for anything that's you know that they can um, say it's older than four years. That said, you've got you know some of the bigger producers here, Heaven Hill, whatever, that are producing pretty you know value priced brands that are you know seven to nine year. Um, you know if that's not being used as a as a uh, a price driver. Beautiful. Any other comments or questions for Michael? All right, Greg, welcome. Well, thank you. Good to be here. I'm, I'm Greg Mefford. Um, I'm the uh, international sales director for a um, company known as Luxco Today. Who knows in a few months what the actual name of it will be, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I've got a background um, on the international side. I was fortunate to spend the first, team, first 13 years of my career with uh, Gallo. Um, and 10 of those were spent in Europe on the front end of them developing their international European distribution base. Um, so that took me over uh, to live in Brussels for three years and in Paris for six years and opened, actually opened the French market um, for, for Gallo. And um, because of that, sort of became an internationalist, if you want to call it that. And, and through a meandering path that led me to eventually starting on with Luxco about seven years ago to help them start to build their international portfolio um, or really uh, international platform for uh, the products. At the time, Luxco was very uh, domestic centric um, and had very little international presence. And, and little by little, I hope to think we've moved the needle over the last few years. And what I referred to earlier is recently, some of you probably are aware we were, we were acquired or merged, depends on who you wanna to talk to uh, on that subject matter. Uh, with the MGP brands and are going to become uh, in a few weeks time officially when the deal, I guess, will close um, their branded portfolio uh, for uh, the, 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 the company known as MGP, but will be the, the branded division. So all of the brands will, will be run by the current, the current sales and marketing teams of, of Luxco going forward. So um, and so, yeah, so I, I don't have as much, obviously, uh, probably, although it does sound like there's some international presence on this. Um, you know, we have uh, Luxco itself uh, is uh, a multifaceted company in some ways, um, 60 some odd years in the business, um, family owned and operated until January 11th of this year. Um, and we have distilleries, two distilleries in Kentucky. Uh, well, and technically, I guess, three now with MGP, um, one in Indiana. Uh, we have a distillery in Mexico and we have production and bottling facilities in Derry, Ireland, actually, where we do Irish creams and, and, uh, and Irish whiskey. So spread all over the world um, with all sorts of different products and, and um, 
um, so forth and so on. So uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, like I said, I'm not as domestic focused. So in fact, I have nothing to do with the domestic market. I'm, um, I'm everything that has to do with uh, outside the United States for Luxton. Well, I have two questions. Uh, okay. One, one is just following on what you just said about, um, you know, you that Luxco will become the brand side of it. So it, I would just, I would assume that that means creating brands out of MGP um, product. <clears throat> I think that's a fair assumption. Obviously, you know, at this stage, um, while the deal was announced to the market back in January, we're still going through the closing stages of it. So until it becomes official, I couldn't give you um, a straight answer on exactly how that's going to work. But that is the assumption. Yes, we will. That will obviously we now have capacity and the ability to develop all sorts of newer brands and create newer brands, um, given now the the facilities that come on board from a production perspective. Um, you know, the thing that Luxco adds, as I understand it, to the MGP side of the portfolio is, is uh, the bottling facilities that we have, because we have multiple bottling facilities now around the globe, Ireland, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and then St. Louis here is where the headquarters for Luxco are, where we, we bottle more, you know, about 4 million cases a year. So they didn't have that kind of bottling capacity, which is, I think, what inhibited, again, this is Greg Mefford's opinion, um, inhibited their ability to do a lot of brand building as opposed to the bulk side of the business. Where, right. you know, so the focus really out. wasn't brand building and, and your focus was brand building and is. So I think, yeah. you know, the idea that they can now have products that ride along with, you know, Rebel Yell and, uh, you know, products that, that, are, that are dominant in the category. Uh, I think that makes sense. My other question really is, is, is one of, you know, your view on the return of the export market to the U.S., which has been decimated, um, you know, over the past two years, first from tariffs, then from COVID, you know, what you're what you're looking at, um, you know, it used to be two, three years ago, business plans had a very significant uh, piece of the business forecast for export sales, especially the American whiskeys, um, the bourbons, uh, and and I guess the question is, do you, how how quickly do you see that rebounding and and um, and for those of us that uh, have investments in bourbon, <laughs> um, for those of us who have investments in, in bourbon that will be mature in the next few years, should we be really looking at the international markets for that? Because there'll be pent up demand. Um, the, the answer to the last part of that question is yes. And, and I'm seeing similar to what comment that was made earlier, you know, um, if you had retail distribution, and this is true in the domestic market, talking to my domestic colleagues, and definitely true around the world, if you had retail distribution, you kind of weathered the storm fairly well. Um, some of my business internationally is retail orientated. Most of my Eastern European business is that way. My Western European business is very on trade. And that came to a screeching halt, obviously, um, up until probably two or three months ago. Um, all of my European importers have at least ordered uh, multiple times now in, over the last three to four months. Um, you know, the UK recently announced its, its next level of, of opening up that kind of starts in April, uh, opens up a little more in May with the idea of all restaurants and bars being fully open, you know, in, in the UK in, in May, I mean, in June. Um, I've noticed in Asia... Um, everybody came back online. China's kind of almost running almost exactly as it was before. So at this point, I've had multiple um, shipments going out that way now at this point too. So things are starting to open up on that level, I think, particularly on the on-trade side. And I think if you look at it, um, you know, from that smaller craft perspective where, where um, if you're, a, you're an upstart kind of brand for Europe, I do think that's coming back and will come back in a big way. Certainly, I think the appetite for American whiskey, particularly obviously our indigenous spirit being bourbon, um, is there. There are always a good foundation that has been created over the last decade about that. And I think the, the curiosity and the want to expand upon age statements and all the things we were just talking about recently, secondary finishing is becoming a big deal and, and proud of the fact that, that our master distiller here at Lux Row has done a lot of great things with secondary finishing. You know, those kind of things are really starting to add uh, curiosity, um, and, and consumers, especially higher end consumers, starting to seek that sort of stuff out. So it's coming back. Um, I do feel Europe is opening up and I do feel like that export market's coming back. It sounds like, and I saw this recently this morning, that the tariff is going to go start to go away. 
I've, I've been saying, I figured by, by the summer, I think that we'll, we'll have worked out our issues with, with um, the little, the little tariff war that was going on. And that'll be, that'll, that'll be rescinded too, which would be really good for everybody in the United States uh, in the spirit on the whiskey side, for sure. Any other questions for Greg or any connections? What, um, what, what brands are particularly selling well internationally for you guys in, in terms of also maybe the price point, the value versus the premium? So, so the, the easy, the low hanging fruit has always been, uh, over the last five years, it's definitely been, it's been bourbons or American whiskeys, or rice too, for that matter. There's a lot of demand for rye um, on the on-trade side. You know, a lot of the, the any of the larger um, cities that have a thriving cocktail scene are finding, you're finding a lot of bartenders uh, and, and traditional mixologists that want to build classic cocktails. And if you're going to do classic cocktails, you've got to have the classic ingredients. And usually those are, you know, American whiskeys, a rye, or certainly a bourbon, right? So that, that has driven a lot of that over the last uh, five or six years. So whiskey is, is a calling card um, in that sense. Um, and, and premiumization is happening in those categories. Obviously, um, the Brown Foremans and the Beam Suntories of the world have, have, have led the charge. Um, and I relate that a lot to what Gallo did with Global California Wines. Um, and they've laid a nice groundwork. And now, and now a lot of consumers um, in, in, um, in a lot of the Western European markets are looking for something beyond those. There's, there's, there, there's a curious meandering out from what was traditional American whiskey and trying to find other things. And, and that's where Luxco has fit the bill for a lot of mid-level importers who don't have uh, something to compete with the Brown Foremans or the Beam Suntories um, and even Sazerac's aggressive move internationally at this point. And, and we find open spaces for people to fill, fill those gaps in their whiskey portfolios. Uh, I'm seeing the same thing on tequila starting to happen. It's not at all at the same level as whiskeys, but there's a general curiosity um, on tequilas, more premium tequilas. And obviously that's thanks to both Bacardi and Diageo and their recent acquisitions over the last few years on the Casamigos and, and the Patron and you know that sort of thing. There's, there's a lot more investment outside the United States in tequila than there ever has been before. I'm seeing that for sure. Question, any other questions? Okay. I'm sorry, but I love that. No, please. Um, I don't know if you want to speculate too much on MGP, but um, I'm sure you've tasted and looked at their brands. And so what do you think is the potential for their brands internationally? I, I think um, I haven't tasted all of them. Um, there's some intriguing stories behind them. I like the Remus story from a brand perspective. I think you could play that up nicely. It, you know, it ties in. Um, uh, full disclosure, uh, Luxco was buying uh, our rye from MGP. So the realities are we were, we were using one of their mash bills for, for the rye. A lot of people in do. In our portfolios. And to date, we hadn't cooked any rye at Lux Row. So as it turns out, we will never be cooking any rye at Lux Row anymore now that our, our, our parent company makes it. So um, given the different mash bills and the different things that they have, I, I can see a lot of potential for expanding some of their brands actually too. Um, you know, and working forward with them. Again, that's just me speculating. Um, you know, the, the brand team might shoot me in the head for saying something like that right now, but there's, I think there's a lot of potential. Clearly there's a lot of good liquid there, you know, and, and, a, and a lot of interesting, um, you know, value adds that could be added to some of the brand lines that they have where you start doing different expressions, so. Thank you. Good questions. Any others? All right. Um, no, I just wanted to comment, Greg, I, I know your colleagues in Derry, uh, I used to work as an engineering consultant prior to getting into our own distillery, and um, about 20 years ago, I actually had my first meeting with them, and um, would have worked with them on and off for, for many years, so I know Kieran and, and Kieran, uh, yeah. yeah, I was just and, talking and, to him this morning. Right, yeah, so yeah. I know those guys for, for many years, so it's good to, good to, yeah. good, good to speak to you. So Likewise. Yeah. Okay. All right, Pixie Paula, hello. Hi there, guys. Hi. I've got tours starting, so I'm like, I want to get through this. Um, I wanted to show you some of the distillery 
because I get the chance to with Zoom. So um, first tell everybody where you are. And who you I'm are. in. Yeah, I, I will. Okay, so I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. I own the Stripe Pig Distillery and Local Trace Spirits. I've been in the industry about 15 years. I'm going to give you this quick tour just because talk about COVID and one of the things we had to do to pivot, we put in an official NBA basketball training center in our distillery. So I'm gonna let you see the coolest thing here. And that's oh, wow. the way that uh, <laughs> that we've pivoted our social center. How about this? Hey, wanna do a trick? Oh my. While you're on camera? <laughs> so um, <laughs> it is like the coolest thing. And we are on the, the um, train tracks on, um, like the best kept secret in Charleston. And so we put this in, we've got events that go on all over the weekends and the afternoons. And uh, it's pretty cool here. It packs an extra 900 cars on the weekend. So mostly it's for the kids and we do walk-ons and scholarships and things. And um, this guy's practicing. Go ahead, watch this. No. <laughs> Did you just make that in? We miss it. <laughs> so he's he's got it like 20 times already today. So, uh, and are you, are you family are driving retail sales <laughs> on weekends. We are. So this is our outside area. Um, we've got a big loading dock and about 1.8 acres for parking. We were one of the, you know, we're considered essential. So when the team, when the state shut everything down, the breweries brought their bear mash over to us. We threw it in the stills and made hand sanitizer for everybody. And they've been very kind to keeping us open, but we have 24,000 square feet. So we've got enough space, 600, 300, 100 gallon stills. I do a lot of different products. We just released a bottled and bond six-year-old bourbon that we made here. And we've got a seven-year-old that we're gonna release and a five-year-old. So we've got Barbados molasses rum back there aging in, con in bourbon barrels. I do some rye whiskey that we age in cognac barrels. These are all 100% corn bourbons. We do, we've got over 50 brands, won over 200 awards beating the market leaders across the board in all categories of spirits. We have a new tech, we have a couple of different technologies but a new technology that's coming out with the purification of our water, adding dissolved oxygen and hydrogen to the water source so that it's, it's made some great improvements on our finished goods. Uh, I'm gonna quickly show you, this is our tasting room. So we have our retail area here. And then in South Carolina, the laws are very different from every other state. It's bizarre how we work. And this is our bar. So Paula, uh, if I recall, uh, when I visited that facility, it was like the day or the day before you were closing on it. Really? And I remember you walking me through that space and saying, this is gonna be the tasting room and we're gonna have this bar here. Now you didn't mention any of the basketball court, but, um, and, and it's, uh, it's really great to see how far you've taken this. And I think there's, there's more, so much more to your story that people should uh, know. Um, and, and you really, you know, I'm, I'm actually, this is a question because I don't know, because we haven't, we haven't been as in touch uh, as we were. But, you know, I, you started out with Local Choice Spirits where it really was producing um, products that were, um, you know, uh, uh, celebrity-based, celebrity-driven <clears throat> brands and products. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with uh, the Terracentia process and, and all that. How much, uh, how much of that are you doing now versus what you're doing with the, the building the brands for the, in the local market um, uh, under the Stripe Pig? Sure. Um, well, I started 15 years ago in the industry coming in as a technology play. And I am the third largest shareholder of Terracentia, which is now Green <clears throat> River Spirits. And our distillery is in Owensboro, Kentucky. So I sat on that board for 10 years. I was an early investor and that's how I learned the business. And I recognized that I wanted to do more authentic distilling. We were really filtration, rectification and rapid maturation technology. My background's in real estate <laughs> and um, taking companies public. I took Duracell public and I redesigned American Express in 94. I've got every letter after my name in the financial services space. So I looked at this as an investment opportunity 
for having one of the few asymmetrical investments out there with you know really high ROI. But I, I as the contract bottler and manufacturers, I just watched all these brands fail in the first year. And I knew the real money was in the brands that made it. And I was already sitting at the table with the big boys hoping they would buy out the technology. So I said, if I'm gonna wait for Diageo to buy me one day or Constellation or Pernod Ricard or Beam, mm-hmm. Um, them and I started launching now this is prior to the iPhone so it's kind of you know unique but I started launching brands that were uh, what I called high visibility or influencer instead of endorsement deals let's do enforcement deals so I offered celebrities and influencers and people who had uh, again endorse enforcement large amounts of restaurants or hotels where we could move products but I offered them instead of some sponsorship or money up front, an actual partnership opportunity. So I had taken everything that I put into the space and were direct full on partners. And so I've got over 50 brands now, um, 10 of them seen by over 10 million viewers on reality TV shows. I've done this all by myself, which I would never recommend, but I, I was a woman in the space with a very big vision and got told no all the time, but I knew <clears throat> was coming and that the age of influencing and partnership branding would be better than just private labeling or contract bottling. So I built the distillery out of cash flow, um, bought this place, and then just started building more brands and love the idea. Like we're, I'm a family, I'm a single female family run business. I gave birth to nine children. Six of my kids are running the distillery. I just got named the chairman of the board of the hip hop fraternity and world star. I'm very into the hip hop branding. I'm about to launch a wholesale direct to consumer platform where just all the consumers can buy through our fulfillment center, these premium products at a value price and a different packaging so that they can pour it into their decanters at home. And we've got a barrel select program. We're doing all kinds of bottled and bond projects for independent labelers or retailers. We try to go the extra way. I've kind of become the manufacturer and the distributor and the marketing person and the business person. So I'm, I'm doing it all, but not, not because I was, didn't want anybody to argue my value and what my dream and my vision was. So I'm just at the point now, believe it or not, after all these years where the banks will just give me loans. I've been able to maintain keeping all of my equity on everything that I've done, um, mostly because people said no, and I was determined to do it one way or another. So it, it happened. Uh, I am looking for equity partners. I'm working with some of the bigger players right now, um, being their importers of records so that we build these relationships and some significant people who are coming on board to do partnership brands with me. I know there's a lot. Is there anything, is there anything else that you do when you're um, Well, I also I, own Skirt I know the Magazine. <laughs> so one of my, I love Skirt I, Magazine. We're celebrating our 27th year. We were the first women's empowerment magazine of the South. And I literally got a call from the Queen of England's team yesterday, and they're going to put a story about me and empowered women. They're actually doing a coffee table book about women's right to vote in the United States, which is crazy because it's like, it seems kind of odd. Um, but through that space, I, I, I do a lot of um, media, working on our reality TV show, getting that podcast thing out there. Um, my book is coming out. I'm writing a book called, I'm an ordained minister, so I'm writing a book called what bourbon taught me about God that I didn't learn in church. And that's about to to come out. And um, it's been an interesting 15 years for sure. And I don't drink. I put ice in my red wine. I'm like the least likely person to disrupt the alcohol industry, but that's been my path. You know what? You are amazing. And I only hope that in your schedule, you can carve out like two hours a month to be a host of a mastermind group, to be a champion because Thank you. Appreciate that. We just got Distillery of the Year Award for the seventh year in a row. So I'm excited. Wow. So so that's all you do? That's it? (laughs) (laughs) So so what else? I I sing, I dance, I do karaoke. (laughs) Sounds like the only thing you don't do to you sleep. I'm part of Tony Robbins' inner circle, if you're familiar with him. So I do do a lot of traveling and network. I I love giving back, and I do love to serve. Somebody's got some... uh... 
Hey, Pixie, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, congrats on the success. Um, I, I actually, I don't know how close you still are with it. I, I spoke to Earl a number of times over the, over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just wondering on the, the technology side of things, whether you're seeing more adoption of, of whiskeys that have been in, you know, I don't know what the right way to say it, enhanced, um, matured or, you know, uh, because it, for a while it seemed like there was a, always the sort of the pushback of, you know, people wanting what was- I think again, in the beginning, you know, when our patent was issued in 2006, it was still new. It was prior to the iPhone. Now you're talking about technology, nobody's pushing back, right? Everybody's embraced technology and they're all trying to figure out ways to make things happen. So we don't even talk about it really anymore because it's just like, if you don't have really good products and you're not using technology to get a finished product that's outstanding and superior, then what's the point? Like, it doesn't even matter how you get there at this point, but you gotta figure out how to get there. And for me, I didn't wanna have the argument of, the conversation about um, d going against the grain, because we never were going against the grain. It, distillation happens the same way. It was just a matter of how do you purify the products and make them as the product integrity as best as that it could be. So I started concentrating on my own technologies in the water industry because I wanted to be able to say, I don't even have to have that conversation anymore. I'm now using oxidation, uh, reverse osmosis oxidation, a, a nano bubble delivery of oxygen and hydrogen into the water. So I've got an enhanced water product and our system, I plan on selling my systems to everybody. Our systems can get plugged into a, a tap, to any tap water. And in a matter of seconds, you have purified water that's completely neutralized and then enhanced with oxygen and hydrogen. So that H2O molecule becomes H3O2 and it just makes a huge difference in opening up just think about when you get a glass of wine, right? Or any of the spirits and you're trying to oxidize it to get that. I'm doing it through the water. So I don't know if you guys know Hans of Fringa. He's a kind of a, a world renowned taster and he's written over 50 books in the spirit space. But he came in a couple of weeks ago and tested all my products. He's, a, he's one of my partners. And um, he was just blown away. And he said, she's a very smart girl. She's not worried about changing any of the products. She's thinking about the water. And it's true. And, and we know in the next 40 years that we're gonna totally be out of water and it's gonna really be our premium. So no one's thinking about those spaces. We're back with my tech group with, with uh, Tony Robbins, we really concentrate on those kinds of opportunities. But even for cleaning up car washes and having the water that, it, we even just did a project with bush beans because they get spillage that they need to clean up before they pour it, pour it back into mother earth. So, you know, that's from a tech space. I'm trying to attack tech on all angles, including my platforms and applications for direct to consumer, my RFIDs, and I'm working on blockchain and Bitcoin. I will be accepting Bitcoin um, on my website and I'm teaching people about, you know, how to, Get, get a Bitcoin wallet and raise some money and trade some booze, booze bucks, I call it, and um, do that direct to consumer play and get the blockchain on all of the bottles so that we know where these bottles are going. We know the end user, we know where they're being touched. We know which retailers are picking them up. We know where they're going when they leave a retail location. So I, I concentrate as much as I can on the tech space. As far as that middle distribution thing, for me, local choice is not just about the spirits we produce. I'm opening my portfolio up to anybody and besides my partnerships, but even other brands. I have other brands coming in now saying, how do we become part of the local choice portfolio? My whole vision was that people would come together on a shared platform and that we could do more collectively. And if I was managing the source of distribution, I become more valuable to the suppliers. So my company, my parent company is called Local Choice under that umbrella with over 50 brands, we look really big to the supplier because everything gets registered under local choice. And since I have licenses in all states and we're working on our third country now, um, it's easy for me to just plug and play anybody who comes in under the umbrella. But because I'm also concentrating on raising money through the celebrities and other 
tech play that I have for Reg A, Reg D raising, remember I'm in the financials, is a new program called Fanvestor, where the celebrities, I will raise the money for the celebrity brands. They, they drive their influencer network directly to our Reg A, Reg D. With the law changes, we can do special purpose vehicles and raise up to $5 million on each brand. So Fanvestor has launched and I think I'm gonna make a difference in that space. I've reached out to LibDib and a couple of other smaller distribution companies to say, do you wanna be on board with me here? Because as long as we can get these, these products delivered directly to these retailers, we're gonna have that influential, influential content and we're gonna be able to reach the retailers and the consumers directly. So I've been concentrating on the story and getting to the end consumer and building Pixie Paula as a brand so that I can tell my story. You guys know that like less than, what is it? One tenth of 1% of distilleries worldwide are owned by women and I'm working on my fourth one. So I need help. I need help. <laughs> I need love it. a lot of help. We love it. We love it. Um, lots, of, thank lots of help offers coming your way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everyone will want a connection with you for certain. So thank you so much for being here. And I know you're running off to do tours now. Tours. I have to yeah. clean the toilets, wash the floors, do the tour. It's glamorous. It's but we glamorous. made a kick-ass limoncello yesterday that I'm so excited about. <laughs> we cannot wait to get our and I gotta Before down. I go, though, I got to show you. Hold on, hold on. I got to grab this bottle and show you. <laughs> So on, we're gonna. Awesome. I'm exhausted. I don't know about all of you. <laughs> so look at was, this. So this was our. This is the bottled and bound. We made history this week again. This is the bottled and bound. We only got 140 bottles out of the barrel, but can you see this color? It's yeah, like yeah. maple syrup. So we put it out yesterday to all of our, um, you know, our membership-based people. Had 140 sign up, and we sold out half of them in an hour. And it's so good i can't even tell you hunter proof seven year old all right we'll have you back for an infomercial another time <laughs> absolutely paula thank you so much oh, for being thank here thank you guys <laughs> thank i'm gonna so still much. listen great great thank you. does anybody have any questions <laughs> derek is going to come to you next i know we're running a little time paula, i ahead, wanted to say that i Oh, that? so, yeah, that's Jordan. We're having some challenges with her. Uh, does anybody want to take my spot? Uh, following Paul is uh, Pixie's going to be uh, 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 un un undoable right now. But uh, it's like uh, combining following the the most outstanding speaker right before lunch. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Thank uh, you. incredible stuff. Holy cow. I'm uh, like you said, uh, uh, Mike, I'm, I'm exhausted listening to Paul, uh, to Pixie right there. So, um, appreciate you having me. Um, uh, I have, uh, nowhere near the pedigree or the background that Pixie does. Um, uh, I've spent the last 20 years or so, uh, in the beverage alcohol space, um, uh, started in this industry with Boston beer company, um, when they were uh, a, a tiny, infinitesimal, uh, uh, just beer company. Um, uh, most recently, uh, I was with Remy Quantro, um, and I, uh, I, I did uh, manage field marketing and the trade marketing group there. And then uh, most, most, most recently, uh, I'm with White and Mackay as their VP of sales. Um, that role, unfortunately, is coming to an end. Uh, for, for numerous reasons, uh, some of which we've already discussed here on the call, but um, you know, the, 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 uh, the pandemic hasn't helped, um, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second, but the, the big thing is the, uh, 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 the tariffs really cratered our, our development and our P&L in the United States um, and, and sort of what we've been trying to do here. Um, uh, for White Mackay, our brands have been in the States for for several years, depending on which brand you're talking about, the one that uh, people probably probably know most about is the Dalmore um, uh, Luxury Scotch Whiskey, um, and uh, and and we are partnered with uh, Gallo is our importer uh, in the states. Um, we're owned by a uh, um, a foreign company called Imperador, 
they're involved in many businesses. One of their one of their largest ones is uh, they're a Filipino company. Uh, they own a brandy company. Brandy is about eighty percent of all spirits sold in the in the Philippines, and they own uh, their their share of brandy in the Philippines is about ninety five percent of all brandy sold. So they know the industry very well. Family owned company. Um, uh, we got involved with them in the states because. Uh, with the Gallo team because of that family orientation. Um, so, uh, so that's my, my quick background story. Um, uh, uh, some of the insights uh, that, that you guys have uh, mentioned already, uh, one of them more COVID related, and I think uh, people have been touching on a little bit today is, is around you know, what brands are doing well and what has, how has COVID sort of impacted the industry overall. Um, you know, and I can, I can give you some perspective on uh, from my discussions with the Gallo team, but also just my, my observations from, uh, from what we're going through with White and Mackay. Um, Gallo has never had a more successful year um, than, than what, uh, what, ju- what they just went through. Um, you know, the, the on-premise is obviously non-existent, has been shut down for a year at this point. Um, but that entire business has been replaced with retail um, and, and retail. Uh, it's really amazing, you know, the growth that retail has experienced um, and where the growth has really come from is, is in these uh, what I would call national or known brands. Um, so, you know, the core brands have really exploded, um, you know, in conversations that I would be having with a Total Wine or with an ABC down in Florida, any of the big buyers from a regional basis uh, that have chain, um, chain scale, um, they would basically say, look, if you're not showing uh, at least 30% growth um, in retail, you're essentially, uh, you're essentially a flat business for us right now. So you need to be exceeding that to be talking to me about uh, increased shelf space, increased promotional programming, uh, anything like that the Gallo team and most of these big national brands, you know, I would throw, you know, any, any big beer brand in there, any, uh, uh, you know, any big uh, 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 vodka, you know, Tito's had an enormous year, obviously, uh, but those national brands succeeded uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, um, uh, e-commerce, direct to consumer and e-commerce exploded uh, literally overnight. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, three years ago, when I was with Remy, I was, uh, I was leading our, our digital and e-commerce sort of evolution um, and, and putting you know, year zero through three plans in place. Um, and that was very slow to, to gain any traction. And in literally a year uh, of COVID, uh, the game has changed overnight. So those known brands uh, obviously are the ones that people were searching for and were ordering um, immediately. And then the other piece that really drove national and known brands uh, uh, velocity is that uh, dwell time at retail just dried up. Uh, So no longer did you have people going in there and standing in front of a shelf, learning about different products, uh, potentially doing trade up, which is a lot of what, you know, um, Scotch whiskey and specifically white Mackay brands are all about is getting people to trade up from Downmore 12 to Downmore 15, hopefully to to some other things, you know, non-age statement stuff. Um, But uh, that literally dried up. So we didn't have people standing in front of a shelf. If they were going into a store, they weren't being uh, hand sold by somebody on the floor that knew about all these products. So our business, uh, White Mackay actually did fine from a volume perspective where we really struggled and where we continue to struggle is on the profitability and the trade up. Um, and that's a, that's a big challenge for the entire industry. Um, so these big brands have gotten much bigger. Uh, value has fallen off a little bit um, because of the reasons that I just said. And then, uh, and, 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 but volume has exploded for brands like, you know, the Gallo sort of core portfolio, um, even, even brands like, uh, you know, uh, our, our entry level um, down more 12 or Jura 10 have really uh, taken off. The problem is we're not getting that trade up that we had forecast. 
Sure, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna ask for questions. We do have a few more people, so hopefully everybody can give us a little bit more time to hear from the rest of the group. Derek, very insightful, appreciate it. Will, go ahead. Sure, thanks and appreciate being able to participate in this. Um, so I work for an investment firm uh, based in Westport, Connecticut, um, called Manitowoc Hill Partners. Um, we've, we manage about 300 million in assets, um, primarily um, high net wealth and um, some family offices, some institutional money. Um, funds been around for a little over 10 years, was spun out of a larger fund before that. Uh, we principally invest in public uh, companies, but uh, have often or from time to time done private investments as well. We look, we invest primarily in uh, smaller companies um, that have good growth potential and um, uh, across different industries, but I've, in, you know, invested in a number of different um, spirits and beverages, uh, alcoholic beverages companies. Um, some um, producers, some brands, um, and uh, increasingly kind of coming back to the sector as well as somewhat of a, also an asset play. I think it's particularly interesting in a period where we might be entering, um, you know, L, you know, increased inflation. And so a commodity like um, whiskey, which only gets better with age um, and the valuation increases over time, um, in an inflationary period that becomes, I think even more kind of potentially attractive of, of a investment and return um, also as an asset um, on top of being sort of bullish on the category for domestic whiskey too. I mean, I think, you know, the premiumization trends, I think out, you know, vodka, which has no flavor <laughs> um, unless you put some, you know, it in something, I think you know, the domestic whiskey is a category that's going to continue to outpace, um, you know, other alcoholic beverages. Um, and so I think there's a number of compelling sort of investment characteristics uh, to the category. And so we are increasingly looking at different investment opportunities. And, uh, you know, these are, are great events to, in terms of trying to meet people and, and learn more what, what's going on and potentially coming across, you know, different investment opportunities. So a little bit of... Yeah, glad you're here, Will. Questions uh, for Will or any connections? Um, I do have a... Look, Will, I, I know we've had conversations about Bourbon Bond and we need to have, continue that, but uh, I, something came across my, uh, my screen, not my desk, it was a Zoom meeting about two hours ago. Uh, that uh, just want to make a connection request to talk about it because I, I think it, uh, I'm still digging into it, but it could potentially be something that fits your uh, objective. Okay, Sounds great. Good. All right, any others for Will? Good to have you here. Chris? Hi, everyone. Uh, Chris Green. I'm with uh, Legends Distillery here in Cumming, Georgia. Um, my background is actually in marketing and design. I worked for the PGA for 15 years doing the FedEx tour and the nationwide tour. And uh, I also designed a lot of the marathon stuff for Boston Marathon and New York and the Atlanta Peach Race. Uh, my biggest client was Spartan Races. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, very cool company. And uh, Legends actually reached out to me about coming on board and taking over as a CMO. Uh, we needed to market this new technology that we came up with here. Uh, to create our, our spirits. And the technology we came up with, and it's patented, protected, is quantum purification. And, and in layman terms, what our technology does, it reduces the toxins in alcohol by around 50%, mostly ethyl, methanol, butanol. Uh, key elements that give you a, a burn on the back of the throat, and then the, the headache, the nausea the next day, depending on the spirit you're drinking. Uh, we scientifically have proven we've reduced those uh, impurities by about 50%. And by doing so, in our first calendar year, we produced um, four lines of spirits, a vodka, an, an 87 proof bourbon, a 100 proof double barrel bourbon, and 115 weighted bourbon. And we won 21 awards 
in our first calendar year, including Vodka of the Year uh, at the John Barleycorn. Uh, and we also won the prestigious Platinum Best of Class for our 100 at the 2020 SIP Awards, which has now put us into a category for a Consumer Choice Award uh, for 2020. Uh, so this technology is, uh, it's something special. It's something that hasn't been done before. Um, and and it's, it's opening up people's eyes on how to enjoy spirits again. Uh, kind of like what Pixie's doing with the water side of stuff, um, which is genius. Uh, what we're doing is on the back end of it with the actual uh, finished product. Um, the, the number one thing we found here in Georgia is the women aren't drinking bourbon. Um, they're drinking the clear liquids. They're drinking the vodkas. They're drinking uh, the gins. But with something where you've eliminated now a bourbon that's an 87 proof to 100 proof and there's no burn, anymore without actually uh, affecting the taste profile. So it tastes in, and has all the elements and flavors of a true bourbon, but now the burn is gone. We've had a tremendous increase in women now drinking and enjoying bourbon in this market, um, which is tremendous. Um, but what we've been able to accomplish in one year is growth. Um, when we first started, our distillery was 3,400 square feet. We're now up to 20,000 square feet. We're, we're building a 4,000 square foot tasting room and bar with an event space and uh, an aging house. Uh, we went from five or six package stores to almost 300 in less than nine months. Uh, people carrying us, pushing us, promoting us, mostly because we actually do have an in-house marketing team and we have our own sales reps that go out and they work hand in hand with our distributors. So uh, Empire is not just out there pushing us, we're pushing us for Empire also, which they appreciate and it makes their job a heck of a lot easier. Um, when we released our wheated bourbon, we had a tremendous boom in sales and it led to a, us having to develop a barrel pick program, which we weren't necessarily geared up for, but we adjusted and made it happen. Uh, Total Wine has been one of our biggest um, uh, providers for this, for the barrel picks. They're, they're buying multiple barrels across the board now. By getting Total Wine, the big players, now a lot of the smaller mom and pop stores, they want to have a piece of that too. So we're starting to branch out from getting from Tower, Total Wine, the big players to a lot of the smaller places and we market them. And that's what they appreciate more than anything else because they don't get the attention. We give them that attention through uh, aggressive marketing campaigns through social media. Um, we just, because of the growth, we couldn't cash flow that growth immediately. So we opened up for investments and we already landed two or three investors immediately. And we're talking to a few more now to expand even more. Uh, we don't want to be just another distillery in Georgia. Um, we want to actually branch out and really take market share in predominantly the Southeast. Really be hitting uh, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. Um, we can get this corridor. Uh, that just opens up for more expansion beyond there. I can vouch for the taste. I had actually had, had a tasting yesterday of everything. Uh, and and you really didn't invite me? Sorry. <laughs> Next time. But I also exactly. wanted to point out, and this feeds into some of the other conversations that their technology, it, it, it's based on, it starts with, you know, aged product. So they're, so they're sourcing, their contract sourcing aged whiskey, and then they're doing the finish. So it's not a replacement for the aging, and it's really that balance. And I think that was really, you know, um, I thought of interest is that, you know, it's, it's, it's still respect of the traditional way, but it's, uh, it's that process that really does uh, create something very special. Uh, and so um, I'm excited because we we actually I just we just met and um, I'm ho hoping that victory can can uh, work and, and help achieve some of these uh, continued successes um, uh, with the with the team there and it's uh, it's pretty impressive they they opened their doors in January before the pandemic we literally launched our brand in March 2020 when COVID went rampant in the country yeah. uh, Georgia went into full lockdown we had. 25 pallets of product ready to ship and our distributor said we can't ship right now we literally can't do anything our drivers cannot do a single thing so we we were delayed three months launching the brand and we still were able to hit the numbers on growth that we were hoping to hit 
um, which is a, a key thing. And to to uh, go to, to Greg over at Lutzco, uh, we have complete transparency as far as where we are getting our product. We are MGP sourced. Uh, all of our bourbon comes from MGP, our GNS comes from MGP. And we even print it on the side of the bottle that it is distilled in Indiana. Uh, we don't try and pull the wool over people's eyes. What makes us unique is the technology and the actual finished product of this quantum purified uh, spirit. Um, but yeah, we're, we're proud of where we get our product. MGP is a, is a fine company and we don't hide that. Love it, love it, love it. Questions for Chris. Fascinating. I can't wait to come visit <laughs> when, I, when I'm back in Georgia. I wasn't there. So um, Lawrence and Michael will let you uh, bring it home. Lawrence happens to be one of the members of Real Professionals Network from the commercial real estate side of things. So this is a nice crossover for us. So Lawrence and Michael, nice to meet you both. Yeah, definitely. No, very, very good group. Uh, I think, again, it's gone very well today. Um, now, I personally work on the advisory side. We work with Anshin CPAs is a a top 50 CPA firm uh, working nationwide, really. Uh, I brought Michael along as he's part of the CPG group, so works very closely in the food and beverage space as well. Um, but from my side, I mean, I'd love to sort of just mention, I do a lot in the research and development tax credit space. Um, so this, for distilleries especially, this past year has been a great opportunity, um, especially for smaller businesses. Uh, we saw some of them pivoting and creating hand sanitizer and everything that has honestly has made the business profitable. Uh, we saw some revenues increasing by three times of what they did have because of the hand sanitizer in some cases uh, with a few of our brands in uh, New Jersey, a couple of distilleries there. So, but just to make sure you're all aware that obviously any new processes, new products that you're putting out, always make sure you're talking to your CPA firm about that because there are generally some good R&D tax credits that you can get, which, is, um, which obviously gives you cash in hand right? I mean, it's taking, taking direct money off the taxes that you're paying. Um, so it's always good. And, um, and yeah, and we're obviously trying from a, a larger perspective. I, I deal a bit on the cybersecurity realm as well. So if anybody has any of those questions, always happy to help. I know um, uh, who was it? I think it's just popped off, but I think it was Mark was having a bit, oh, Mark is there. You were having a bit of trouble with the Kaspersky firewall. We're actually cyber engineers. So if you need a I'm sure it'll be a quick fix. If you need a bit of help, just let me know. Um, and I'll pass it over to Michael. Yeah, thanks. Thanks guys for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm learning a lot from everybody today. And you know, it's been, it's been great so far. Um, and I'll make this quick for the sake of time. Um, I'm, I'm a senior manager at, at in Anshin's food and beverage practice. And uh, I've been here for over you know, 10 years. I have a lot of clients that are either, you know, startups, probably starting anywhere from 5 million and all the way up past 100 million for the well-established businesses. So, we, you know, we we have a lot of experience with all businesses and, and food and beverage, all different sizes. Um, and we're, you know, we're a New York City-based CPA firm, but these days that really doesn't mean anything anymore, right? You, you you work wherever you live, and you know everything is done remotely now. So, you know, that kind of uh, that kind of assists us from that perspective. Uh, the, you know, the way I really view Anshin is that we're, really, we're, we're advisors with all the businesses and clients we work with, right? We, 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 we're always in contact with all of our clients, you know, some CPA firms, you know, they, you, you talk to them once a year, you get your financials and taxes done and that's it. That's not what we're about. We're here to be your true advisor, work hand in hand, you know, go through your numbers, see where you can make some, where you have some efficiencies, where you can have better presentation, how to approach your banks, how to deal with your, uh, your uh, private equity investors, you know, a lot of our clients are funded by private equity. Um, and there's a lot of owner, onerous things that they need to do in order to keep in compliance. But I mean, aside from all the compliance stuff, we're there just to help you in achieving your goals. Um, so that's just Anshin, Anshin basically at a very high level. Um, the one thing I just, I wanted to quickly share my views, you know, in general, what I'm seeing in, in the industry, uh, again, very high level is really, uh, since the pandemic started, I mean, everyone was bunkered down at home. I mean, what were we all doing? We were, we were at home, you left your house either to go to the grocery store, maybe get gas, go to the liquor store, and that was really it. The interesting thing that I saw, and you know, talking to all my clients, a lot of them were experiencing the same thing, was that these um, consumers were going into the store and they were running to get what they were comfortable with, putting it in a shopping cart and getting out of the store. They weren't 
they weren't shopping, right? They weren't looking, they weren't perusing, they weren't checking out new brands or new things that were being introduced. So a lot of um, startup companies were having so some issues with in dealing with that and other established companies that wanted to put out new products weren't having success. That all changed a couple months later as people were starting to get more comfortable with the new way of life and they, were, they really were looking for something new. I know now when I go to, you know, I'm in New Jersey, I go to shop right down the street and I'm, I walk in there, I'm kind of tired of all the stuff I've been buying since March, I'm looking for something new, right? Same thing, I go to the liquor store now, you know, I, I have my typical brands that I, that I like. I mentioned LaCroix before, that's, that's one brand that I love, but I'm always, now I'm, in the, I'm at that point where I'm venturing out and I wanna try new things. Um, in connection with that, the one thing that's really um, very hot in the overall beverage industry is, is uh, really sustainability and human rights. And what I mean by that is consumers wanna know your story. They wanna know what your company is all about and what you're doing for uh, the environment, how you're potentially helping you know, the, the uh, workers who are procuring your raw materials, right? That might be coming from third world countries. They have lower wages. They don't have a great uh, living situation. And the companies that are out there that are trying to actually give back and help people in, the, in their supply chain are really, are really have, are doing very well because they're, they're communicating their story. They're packaging, and I'm sure Chris, Chris you mentioned you're, you were in very big in branding. You know, the, it's all about the packaging and how you can communicate that story. And all these clients that we have that are doing that and giving back are finding tremendous success here. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because that's something typically I don't really see too much. When I walk into my local liquor store, I, don't, I walk in and you know, the, the, the packaging is vibrant and I see a lot of new brands, but Nothing, that, nothing to me on, at a face value communicates the story. Um, so that's something that's really big. And that, you know, we have a lot of beverage clients that are 20, 30 million dollars, they're startups and they have a great story. And these companies are selling for two, 300 million and more. I mean, the valuations out there are pretty wild right now. And there's a lot of money uh, to, to be had. If, you're, if you guys are looking for investments, there's a lot of private equities out there that are looking to support you guys. So. Um, in general, that's what I wanted to really communicate here. That's what I'm seeing overall in the industry and uh, happy to have a conversation after this if anybody wants to connect. So thank you Appreciate for having it. me. This has been really great. Great. No, thank you for being here, both you and Lawrence. Questions for either? Um, will you sponsor this? <laughs> <laughs> Let us know we went to the end for the sales okay. pitch, right? Oh, that, was a, that, was a, that was a setup. Um, <clears throat> okay. Has everyone, oh, Chris, yeah. Sorry, Michael, can you connect uh, Michael and Lawrence and myself? Absolutely. A lot of cool thing, cool questions for you guys, man. Mm -hmm. Especially on those tax credits. Yeah, this tax and credit thing is definitely a hot topic. Has everyone, has everyone, has everyone um, we've gone around the, the horn? So? We have. Mm -hmm. Well, if I so can Michael, say, yeah. A quick, quick question. I'm, yeah. I mean, there's just not a single person in this group I wouldn't be benefited by 10 or 15 minutes or a half hour or a day with. Uh, it's obviously the case. So I, it, it'll be okay if I reach out and connect with every individual. Is, is that all right? Um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm anxious to have some kind of conversation. Um, well, and I, and I think I, I encourage it. I think that really what, what I wanted to say here is that I, I found this to be extraordinary and I thank you all because organically we created really a great example of how this can work. And imagine if we were in a, in a group that was meet, meeting on a, on a monthly basis and we were really getting to do work together and to learn about each other and understand what the pain point of the other person is. So in between, we could bring real solutions. That really is the model for the mastermind groups. I'm, I, 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 you know, the, the, this idea of an industry roundtable is something that evolved because when COVID struck and all the mastermind groups for real estate were unable to physically meet, um, Rick called me and we brainstormed some ideas. And I said, you don't have to be limited to your market. You can open it up to these topics. Now that's for members only. But my, um, my belief is that if you, if you share and you, and you share the value uh, and you start developing relationships that people you know, will understand that this was a lot of time to commit, but it, hopefully it's worth it. So I, I have a couple of asks. I would ask everyone who is on this, who feels that they benefited to 
not only share it across their LinkedIn and reference that they're that they were part of it. We're gonna we're gonna turn this around in video. It'll be available for, for people to share. But I would also ask that you invite at least two people to the next roundtable, um, just to encourage them to attend and, and go to the drinkprosnet.com site and do, do what you guys did. Just sign up. Uh, and then we're gonna, you know, I want to hear from you, and Stephanie will be following up as well. I want to hear from anyone who really does understand a little bit more about this and wants to know more about um, either being a meeting meeting champion for a specific group, which would be a group that meets monthly, probably about this size, right? Uh, or to uh, if it's if you're a company that wants to uh, be a, a founding member uh, and and you know and bring more members of your team. Uh, to the table and invite prospects and customers to these things. That's great. Uh, and then, of course, if any individual just wants to be, um, you know, participate in this. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm indebted to Stephanie and the work that she and the Real Professionals team have done to create it uh, and for their willingness to say, sure, let's extend, let, let's extend the brand to drinks. Um, so uh, I, I'm very appreciative of all of you. And um, I hope you all feel like you got some value because that's it. If you don't participate, you don't get value. 100%. I, I want to say, again, I'm a real estate person. I enjoy my drink as much as the next person. This has been fascinating. I've learned so much today. Um, the key is the follow-up. Sherman, everybody on this call will get each other's V cards. Absolutely follow up. That's the name of the game here. And obviously, there was a lot of good sharing and some good connections. So make sure you follow up. And we will look forward to seeing hopefully all of you as michael said at the beginning we're doing this the first friday of each month so that puts us on uh, april 2nd um, at 11 30 we'll be following up with each of you again but nice to meet all of you thank you and thank michael you. thank you for and the video thank you. The video recap will be uh on um, both youtube at boom zoom net and linkedin and fb on victory spirits development and on drinkprosnet.com thank you thank you so thanks, much guys. Nice meeting you. thanks everyone have a great weekend and stay safe Thank Thanks, you. Thank you.